Aquí se trata de una acción política. Y la coca se ha convertido y la marihuana en un arma revolucionaria de lucha contra el imperialismo norteamericano. El talón de Aquiles del imperialismo son los estimulantes de Colombia. He was an OG, original gangster, one of the biggest cocaine bosses and gangsters ever. He was really the Henry Ford of drug smuggling. He turned it into a very serious business. He was like a, uh, uh, a young entrepreneur, the kind of entrepreneurs we see in Silicon Valley uh, today. Boeing pioneered the massive movement of people around the planet. Carlos Leather pioneered the massive movement of cocaine from Colombia. Carlos later earned the nickname, the Colombian Rambo. He was hiding out in the jungles of South America, excommunicated from his partners, cut off from the world, and vowing a fight to the end. Indicted three separate times on a litany of narcotics and conspiracy charges, U.S. authorities say at the height of his reign, he brought in more than 18 million tons of cocaine in 24 months. I don't think you'll find another character in the history of the drug trade that's more interesting. You have been accused of being a Nazi. Is that a crime? Not in Colombia. His personality is, is so bizarre and so unpredictable. You know, he's hanging around leftist guerrillas, yet he loves Adolf Hitler. And yo, sí, le digo con toda sinceridad de que Adolfo con seis millones de soldados He's espousing uh, anti-American uh, rhetoric. La elección de Ronald Reagan es una muestra de la decadencia en que se encuentran los Estados Unidos de Norteamérica. But he spends a lot of time in, in the United States where he learns perfect English, right? It's a very dirty cold war going on there. He's ruthless, very violent and very vicious but he has a soft spot for John Lennon. He commissioned a huge sculpture of John Lennon. A nude statue with a bullet hole in his chest. Crazy Carlos, he made the rounds. He built an island paradise in the Bahamas and launched his own personal cocaine invasion into the United States. He was both a mathematician and a thug. His idea was, was very simple. Buy a, uh, an island in the Bahamas and bring a cargo plane in uh, full of a mass quantity of cocaine, break it up into smaller parcels and fly it into the United States in whole mess of planes all at one time. You know, 15 planes taking off within a 25-minute period. His operation was all but an open secret. Crazy Carlos paid for the island and for what he believed was security against the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration. The Bahamian government would notify them if DEA was looking at Norman's K and they would have lead time to evacuate and destroy any and all evidence there. Carlos started to take part in some of his own product, and that became a, a bit of a problem. And he also was far too uh, uh, open about what he was doing. Joe later had been revealed as a cocaine-snorting kingpin rather than an ocean-loving developer. The Bahamian authorities didn't want any legal issues themselves. So they tell him he's got to leave the island. I think between that and the, and the pressure now on the Medellin drug cartel, um, I think Carlos, his partners, closed up Normans. Authorities dismantled the five-year-old operation. Later's house was found burned to the ground. He escaped before the raid. 
Crazy Carlos would turn up in Colombia, but his homeland was not the sanctuary he had hoped. In the early morning hours of February 4, 1987, Colombian National Police raided a farm just outside of Medellin. Fifteen men were captured. Crazy Carlos was among them. Charged with delivering 3.2 tons of cocaine into the U.S. in just a two-year period, an estimated 80% of all the cocaine brought into the states during that time. Carlos later was found guilty and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, plus 135 years for good measure. When they add the plus 135 years, they really want to make sure <laughs> there isn't a chance at all that you could ever get out. Comma, unless you're Carlos later, things change from a few years later. Two years into later sentence, the U.S. invaded Panama to take down a dictator. Manuel Noriega was a close ally of the United States. And in terms of Panama, the only thing the United States ever cared about was the security of the Panama Canal. By 1988, the United States began to view him as a, as a liability. So all of a sudden, they switched course, and uh, Noriega became this real boogeyman. Carlos later knew Noriega. Everybody in the DEA who worked the case, everybody in the U.S. government who thought that it was important to get him extradited uh, from Colombia here must have just absolutely grabbed their head and wanted to rip their hair out when Carlos raised his hand in jail and said, oh, Manuel Noriega, I can testify against him. I've got some good stories, as a matter of fact. Noriega had been on the U.S. government payroll for decades, but the dictator had overstepped his bounds when he began harboring drug dealers. Carlos later, once public enemy number one, became a pawn in a bigger game. But he testified against Noriega. They cut his sentence down to 55 years, which is stunning for what he did, the trail of bodies, the amount of drugs, and everything else. And then three years after that, they come in at night once to Carlos's jail, and they take him out. According to prisoners who were there, federal authorities came in and just whisked him away. And that's the last we heard of later. He's in some part of the witness protection program inside the Bureau of Prisons. If they, in fact, did put him in witness protection, uh, we wouldn't know. The significance of this is it makes <laughs> later sort of an urban legend because there's no official word. The U.S. government won't say where he is. So he's a complete mystery, and he's still a legend. There are rumors that he's out of the system, but I know this. Carlos caught a hell of a break. <laughs>